got the thumbs up that I'm on. So we are going to start by moving. I'm going to have all of you guys stand up for a second and find uh, arms width apart. We're going to do a four-minute workout together to turn on the brain because we're about to get a brain dump. And so here we go for the nitric oxide dump first. And so a four-minute workout, it's one of the funnest things I've ever created in my clinics. And so we're going to start, you need that arm width so that you don't hit the person next to you because you're going to be swinging your arm. So if it looks like you might do physical harm to somebody near you, just adjust. All right, here we go. It's going to be a good squat. Butt back into the chair and then right back up. And we're going to do 10 of those. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then the arms, 90 degree swing. We call it the marching man. It looks like the old tin soldier. Ten on each arm. That's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Big circle up above the heads, down in front of your pelvis. Big 360 degree circle you're making. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, straight over the head. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, back to the squat. Second set. We're rocking now. Four, five. You look as ridiculous as you feel. Seven, eight, nine, ten. I do this in the airport all the time. And part of it's for the exercise, but part of it's just to see the reactions of people <laughs> seeing me do this in a public space. They're like, is that guy know that we're all looking at him? All right, big circles. Here it comes. This is the most important one of all of the movements we do because you never reach above your head in a day anymore. Everything's conveniently placed down in front of you. And so we ought to get those arms up to extend the chest and breathe deep. Last set, good news. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Arms, marching man, work it. Don't get sloppy. Good to hard hand point. Straight arms. Ten on each arm. Then we're in a big circle. Work it. Jane Fonda's got nothing on you. <laughs> Here we go. I have to pick the audience carefully that I say that name to you because most people are like, who? All right. That doesn't mean you're old. It just means you're wise. All right. And there we go. Give yourself a round of applause. All right. Sense what's going on in your fingers right now. What do your fingers feel like? Tingly. They feel tingly, absolutely. What you did is you just released nitric oxide from the 16 largest muscle groups in your body. Nitric oxide is a communication molecule. We'll be talking about molecular communication throughout this talk. And so I wanted you to know that this is the only way you actually participate in this big communication network of redox signaling is this molecule of nitric oxide. The rest of it's done by mitochondria and bacteria and fungi, none of which are human. So interestingly, we have a tiny, tiny role in coordinating cellular communication and function. And the only time we do it is when we run out of oxygen at the muscle and we dump nitric oxide. You don't do that enough. You're aging because you're not communicating. Cells that have unfettered access to information never age, never get disease. We have the mechanisms of repair. If we get an acute injury that exceeds our, our machinery of repair, then we can simply replace the tissue via stem cell. All these stem cell therapies that are becoming popularized now, it's a stepping stone. It, we, it is ridiculous to think that you need some exogenous source of stem cells. You are full of millions of stem cells that are ready to activate and replace your, your, your body. And so if we wake up to the reality of what the biology is telling us today is, you should be bulletproof, you should be able to regenerate all of the time, and aging should look more like an African elephant that will live the full 70 to 120 years of its life and then die by walking to the elephant graveyard one day and lay down. That's how life and death should work for us as humans as well. We should be born, we should exceed into our optimal state of health by the time we're 12, 14 years old, be in our physical state at, at maturity, and then ride that wave of, of perfect function for the next 8, 10, 100 generations as we get stronger and stronger, not weaker through adversity. Acute inflammation makes us stronger, not weaker. It, we don't actually start to become weak until we tip into chronic inflammation. And so chronic inflammation only occurs when you have a lack of communication. So what we just did in four minutes 
less than, was release nitric oxide throughout your whole body. The tingling you were feeling in your fingers is actually happening in your brain as well. There's oxygenation happening to the tissue level, and you're turning on youth in your body. One of the best measures of human health turns out to be something, through what we call heart rate variability. Heart rate variability tells us, are you biologically 16 years old or 60 years old? And it can pinpoint that very accurately. We have a lot of 80-year-olds that have a physiology of a 60-year-old or a 50-year-old, and we have a lot of 40-year-olds that have the physiology of 80-year-olds. It's because their biology is mismatched with their chronology there, and it's due to a lack of communication, typically. What we have found with that four-minute workout is we can re erase 30 years on the biologic age with just three months of that four-minute workout being done a couple times a day. That's a pretty big deal. Would you like to be 30 years younger? I just taught you the most important youthifying movement that you can possibly do. Interestingly, none of you are going to go home and make that a routine. When I say none, it'll be one or two of you will do this. But you just got the information that would make you younger in three months by 30 years. Why won't you do it? The reason you won't do it is because you're lacking an overall unifying philosophy by which to live life by. The philosophy you live by doesn't include self-love. That's interesting. You and I are living a philosophy that's missing this vital element of self-love. And therefore, self-care fails. Because it's not actually part of our overriding philosophy. I know many of you, and I know I can see myself in you, is that our self-identity and much of our self-worth is actually in our state of service. We are taught to serve, 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 serve at the expense of not having time to do a three-minute workout that would make us 30 years younger. Fascinating that you're missing a philosophy of self-love, as am I. And so what are we going to do to recode this philosophy? There are many, many ways of approaches to that, but more importantly is the why. Why will you do this? Why will you now remake your philosophy? Why will you now rewrite your history that includes self-love at its most severe foundation? Why? Because you showed up here right now. Homo sapiens, by the fossil record, and we're not talking about Neanderthals and the other precursors to Homo sapiens. Our species, Homo sapien, in this exact physical form, have been here 180,000 years. And by the numbers of biology, we know we have about 70 years left. The current expectant life age of, of a male or female in the United States is about 78 years old. So somebody born today will expect to see the human extinction before they can live out their full expected life. And you showed up right now. You showed up right now on purpose. You picked right now, not 50 years ago, not 120,000 years ago. You showed up right now. An ancient soul that I believe inhabits you showed up right now on purpose, with purpose, and needs a unifying philosophy to transform this species before it destroys itself and takes about 80% of the biology on life, on the life on Earth with it. We're almost halfway through the sixth extinction on Earth. Did you know that we've killed 40% of biodiversity on the planet in just 50 years? We're almost halfway done with the, the extinction of life on the planet, this time done by human hand, not an asteroid hitting to wipe out the dinosaurs and all life this time done by our own technological slide. Why is our technology crushing us and killing us? Because we don't love ourselves. That golden rule, love thy neighbor as yourself. We're all trying to love our neighbors at our own expense. Therefore, our neighbors feel unloved because the golden rule works. If you don't love yourself enough to take care of yourself, then where does that leave your relationship with your neighbors, your children, your, your synagogue, your church, whatever it is? It leaves us bereft of a unifying philosophy of love. But as a hospice doctor, and among my subspecialties, I'm a hospice doctor, and there's nothing more precious than being a part of somebody's end-of-life moment. It's nigh on to the thing that got me into medicine, which was being a part of the birth 
of life. And birthing children was an extraordinary thing, and the squats of the Philippines went there, decided not to be an engineer, decided to go to be a doctor instead, because holding life in your hands is an extraordinary, precious experience. And at the end of life, it's an extraordinary, precious experience to hold the hand of a 103-year-old human being as they pass across the veil. The wisdom they pass on, the literal energy, the electrons that they will pass into you by just you being in their presence is profound. And we're missing it because our unifying philosophy doesn't include self-love, and so we don't even hang out with our dying people anymore. We institutionalize them in hospitals and nursing homes, and they're dying isolated and alone over and over again. And so as humanity, we are losing touch with our transformative capacity of death. 51% of births today in China are done by C-section. In China, 51%. Both at birth and at death, we've become disconnected with our own nature because we lack a unifying philosophy of love. So the four minute workout could be an interesting little access point for you to say, you know what? As ridiculous as it seems, I'm gonna do this little thing. And I'm gonna do this because I love myself. And if I can live an extra 30 years right now, that means I could pass my wisdom on to the last generation on Earth to make sure that they become the first generation of a transformed homo sapien species that will live in concert with nature not in the effort of control of that nature. That was the introduction slide. We're never going to get through this talk. So that just proves what I was just saying. There's no surprises on this thing. If you've heard any of my talks over time, you've seen this slide. The numbers are ridiculous, of course. Autism in 1 in 36 children now. Attention deficit, 1 in 10. Asthma at 1 in 10. That's diagnosed. The majority of these go undiagnosed. And we don't do universal screening for asthma in our pediatric practices in the United States. In Australia, they do do universal screening, and they find one in four children with asthma. One in four children cannot breathe. Allergy in one in four of those children. That's not just like seasonal stuff he knows. This is allergic reaction to the point of anaphylaxis in one in four of our children. And most of that is to their food. Our children cannot breathe, and they cannot eat, and they cannot think. They cannot concentrate. And so what do we do? We put them on prednisone and steroids in their lung, which suppress their immune system, and then we put them on speed for their attention. So we put them on Adderall and Ritalin, which are forms of speed, uh, literal adrenaline hormones, to kick them into a fight-or-flight state so that they can answer multiple-choice questions on a test. Do you see the insanity of what the, our doctors are doing to our children? We are doing something insane, which is put a child in fight or flight. The brain is very predictable neurochemistry. If, the, if you turn on the fight or flight state in the human brain, the first sections to turn off are the creative centers. Because if you're running from a lion that just jumped out, it's a terrible time to compose a poem. <laughs> it's a terrible time to write that love note that's overdue to your partner. If you're in a fight or flight state, you are in a fight or flight state for reason. We are putting our children into a fight or flight state. 80% of the children in college that are on Ritalin and Adderall didn't get it from their doctors, they got it from their friends. We've literally created a social educational environment where children find advantage in sharing speed and adrenaline in fight or flight state to get through in college. At what age are they going to start getting creative? It's terrifying. All right, the rest of the numbers, all terrifying, all bad news. That's why we need to speed through this. Cancer is interesting, though. 49% of American men are now diagnosed with cancer before they die. That does not count skin cancer. 49%. One in three women are now diagnosed with cancer before they die. Dementia, one in one. That's a weird statistic. That sounds like 100%. Well, it turns out this study came out of the University of Virginia almost 15 years ago. It needs to be redone because the numbers are going to get worse. How do you get worse than 100%? It's the age at which this happens. In this study done in the early 2000s, they found that all of the people in the study, they were doing sensitive neurocognitive testing of the whole population across ages of like 12 to 95, and they found out that 100% of the subjects by age 28 had early signs of dementia. 
Now, most of you look younger than 28, but I'm warning you, you're about to slam into this moment of sliding memory. And you haven't had it happen to you yet, but you're going to start putting down your keys, and seconds later, you're not going to have a clue where you put those keys. You're going to have a to-do list when you wake up in the morning, and by 10 o'clock, you're going to forget you ever had that to-do list, and you're going to be distracted by your email or your Facebook or whatever else is happening, and you're not going to be able to retain your sense of purpose in the day. We are turning into a very distracted and drugged world. And we're doing the same thing, bizarrely, to all of the nature around us. Our pets are a great example. Our pets are going through this same process. But interestingly, I spend a lot of time with livestock now. One of my companies is developing uh, in dietary supplements in, uh, in, the, in the drug category because it's going into the human feed system. Uh, we're in our large-scale cattle trials and feedlots, and so I spend a fair amount of time on feedlots. And when you're with 100,000 cows, and there's only 11 humans, you feel like a pretty insignificant minority to begin with, but you also have a sense of what the mass of biology on the planet really looks like. 90% of animals on the planet Earth that are over the size of a cat is now domesticated animal by humans. 90%. We have lost the wildlife on the planet for our convenience. It's the pets we own, the cats, the dogs, and the animals we eat, the poultry, the pork, the beef. Those animals have become the dominant life on the planet to the tune of 90%. It's extraordinary change. And when I'm on a feedlot, I actually see the same thing. A cow in a feedlot, two months after leaving a field in Virginia, in the bucolic rolling hills, looks like something out of Western Ireland in rolling hill country, Virginia. All the bucolic, you know, herds of 50, 70 cows suddenly trafficked to a feedlot, and that sweet cow that's so curious, cows are the most curious of creatures, I love them, and they'll, they're always trying to figure out what's going on around them, and, and my daughter loves them since she was a little kid, and she'd go up to the fence, and a few of them would always come over to just check her out. And then you go into the feedlot, and they are so autistic, they can't over, they're so sensory overwhelmed that they are hitting their heads against steel posts and trying to focus because they can't handle any eye contact. And they, they're just isolated, terrified, just like the child in my clinic who has autism who's hitting his head against the wall to create a pain stimulus so that he can focus for a moment. We're creating autism across 90% of biology on the planet through the, the destruction of the microbiome and the, the life within us. That's what happened in three years, in 2012 to 2015. The curve was looking bad, and then we doubled the rates of autism in three-year period. 2016, we had already gone from 1 in 44 kids to 1 in 36 was our most recent numbers just got published two months ago, was the 1 in 36 children with autism in the United States. And so that was 2015 and 2016. So we're on track again to double the rate within the next, with, by the end of 2018. So we'll find out those numbers in 2020. But we are really on track to keep doubling this number vertically, which will put us at one in three children with aut autism by the year 2034. That's the end of our country. There is no society on earth that can handle the loss of productivity and the cost of care of one in three children with autism. Not to mention the humanitarian crisis that our children, one in three, would suffer to the degree that an autistic child can suffer when they are in, in their worst collapse. Now the good news is we can support autistic children and they can improve their health to the point where they are not suffering. And they become these extraordinary creative beings. And so there is a silver lining in this. If we wake up now and stop this before it collapses us, those children will become the transformative angels that we've been needing. They are wired differently on purpose. Can you imagine the courage of a soul that says, I am willing to jump into a body that at 18 months of age will suddenly have a huge neurologic injury and I'll lose my ability to talk, focus, communicate with my parents, and I'll be a huge energetic tragedy in my parents' energy and they will be heartbroken over me, and they will suffer uh, an abusive medical environment that will blame my mom for my condition instead of taking the responsibility of a, of a society that made that, that injury happen to me. Imagine the courage of that soul. 
My life has been so good. I must be one wimpy soul. A child who shows up in that to be a transformative angel is inspiring and hopeful. Cancer, of course, is coming up right now. You see that, that steepening of the line? That's the entry into a logarithmic curve. We're already at one in two adult males with cancer, but we're going, I'm warning you, into that logarithmic period. It's not going to surprise me when suddenly in 2025 this starts to go vertical, which means that by that same 2034 year when we have one in three children with autism, we are going to have somewhere around 80% of adults with cancer. There's no society on earth that can survive that, that burden of disease, that cost of disease, that loss of productivity that's going to happen. The age at which these cancers are happening is terrifying. And it's starting to feel like a roulette wheel, where it used to be, oh, my healthy patients, they weren't going to get cancer. It was going to be my patients that had terrible lifestyles. No, it is my, some of my healthiest patients who have been trying to eat organic, trying to eat healthy, trying to drink water, haven't drank a Pepsi in 30 years. They are the ones getting breast cancer now. We're seeing the collapse of a species. We're participating in it. We're witnessing it. We are now all one degree of separation from somebody who is dying from this syndrome of complete overload at the physiology level. One degree of separation. Many of us sitting in here have experienced cancer in our body. I would argue that all of us are car can carrying cancer cells in our body right now in some shape or form. And if it hasn't shown up as a problem, it's because our body is still has just enough communication going on to keep that in check. Amazing, amazing moment we're in, and we showed up right now. Now, if all of these diseases had different physiologies to them, if, if, if you went into my lab 10 years ago, I was creating chemotherapy to treat cancer. And in my lab, I had all of these giant posters on the walls with huge signaling cascades, all these complex proteins, enzymes, all these things that I thought were causing cancer. This was the pathway of how cancer would happen. And so I was trying to find drugs that would target this pathway. Very complicated. So much so that I became one of the five people in the world that were experts in a little protein called CoopTF1. Have you ever heard of CoopTF1? No, you will never hear of that protein. It's completely worthless information. It was a complete waste of time that I was going after that protein. And it is completely erroneous. And it took me like six years of being steeped in this effort to find chemotherapy before I found out there was not a single cancer in history that had ever been caused by a lack of chemotherapy. As such, there is never a weed that shows up due to a lack of weed killer. Our cancers show up on purpose. Our weeds show up on purpose to show us there's a problem with the underlying architecture and terrain, and it's there on purpose to help, not to hurt. These diseases are there to help us transform, for us to finally see that the terrain is for real, that the terrain is on purpose. And if we choose to learn from the terrain, and choose to learn from these events rather than fight against them. I am so nauseated by this constant message that you and I are bombarded with of the fight against cancer. That is the stupidest approach that you could possibly take to cancer because cancer is ultimately the most lonely, isolated, damaged, weakest cell in your body. So what the hell are we fearing? What the hell are we fighting against? It's literally our body. There is no fear. There is no fight. We need to actually start a new campaign called the acceptance of cancer, the love for cancer. We need to love those cells back into our body because they're ours. They just couldn't hear our self-identity. Why? Because we were not living with an overriding philosophy of self-love. What is the microbiome? We talk all the time about this in farming. We talk about it in in uh, human health all the time now, and it gets a very basic concept. Oh yeah, lots of bacteria, blah, blah, blah. You guys as farmers are actually way ahead of the doctors in knowing it is not just the bacteria, obviously. It is a massive ecosystem of bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses. You guys, are, though I find in the farming world, are still afraid of viruses. And I would say that that's the same thing with integrated medicine doctors. We've come to kind of 
grasps that there's important bacteria, that the bacterial microbiome is good, but if we hear the word virus, we're like, whoa, that's all bad. That's ridiculous. I'm going to show you why it's ridiculous here in a bit. But an estimated 30 to 40,000 different species of bacteria, a population of more than one quadrillion organisms in and on your body. That's pretty amazing. But how many fungi, viruses? There's just too many to categorize and quantify. But I want to give you a sense of this scope. One species is human, Homo sapiens, 70 trillion cells in a single adult. That's an amazing number. That's equal to our national debt. <laughs> 70 trillion cells in a single human being, and there's 20,000 genes in there. When I was a doc being trained to be a doctor in the early 90s, I was told, you are going to be the first generation of doctors that's going to be able to predict exactly what diseases all your patients are going to get and predict exactly what drugs are going to help that person because we're going to have the genome decoded. And you're going to be brilliant. And you'll just take a little swab of the cheek and you'll know everything you need to know about that person. We knew it was going to be a big task to decode the human genome because there was over 200,000 proteins in the human body, which means we needed to find 200,000 genes, which was why it was so dismally confusing and disappointing that we had 20,000 genes. Just before we had decoded the human genome, we had decoded the Drosophila, the famous fruit fly. And John Gilday, his PhD in my lab, became one of the first guys to uh, do this in his PhD at Johns Hopkins. He has a PhD. I, you have to have just such respect for some of these PhD projects. His was to look at one million fruit flies under a microscope and, and map their phenotype, their physical characteristics, to their genetics. Have you ever done anything a million times? <laughs> Other than breathing, I don't think you have. A million times, he's, he plated a, a fruit fly, squished it, slid it under the microscope, documented all of its little features, the type of antennae, the color, the blah, blah, blah. He became so well acquainted with fruit flies in this journey that if he was at a a family picnic and a fruit fly flew by, he could tell everybody if it was a male or female. <laughs> That's disturbing intimacy with fruit flies. Well, the disturbing thing that he knew was that that fruit fly had 13,000 genes. To find out that we were only maybe a third more complicated than a fruit fly seemed like kind of a frustrating outcome. But of course, we had already looked at a flea and that humble flea has 30,000 genes. You fall somewhere between a fruit fly and a flea. And you're, pretty, you're actually closer to the fruit fly. How is that possible? How did we make these human bodies, 200,000 proteins all working together out of 20,000 measly genes? Very confusing. Mitochondria, it turns out at the moment that you are conceived, one human cell, an ovum that's now been infected with a sperm. And I use those words carefully because a sperm actually is not really a human cell. It doesn't have mitochondria. It's not actually eukaryotic. It looks more like a bacteria with a flagella on the back of it. And so you, it's really an infectious process getting pregnant. And the male has now finished his, his journey into, into parenting. And the whole rest of the journey is now done by the woman. That one ovum that is a whole human cell is actually filled with mitochondria, just like all of my cells are currently. The average number of mitochondria in a single human cell is 200. Mitochondria look like bacteria, except that their genome looks more like a virus. So there's some mashup of a virus and a bacteria that lives inside your cells. And they proliferate inside your cells. They can die, they can grow, they can proliferate, they can reproduce, irrespective of what your cells are doing. There's three species of mitochondria. Scientists don't talk about that because suddenly if you admit there's three species of mitochondria, you admit that's a non-human little entity and there's multiple species of those guys living inside of us and we don't know why. We don't know why there's three species of mitochondria, but they have very limited genes, 37 genes. But look at their number, 14 quadrillion compared to our 70 trillion. So the genomic information and in even that first cell of the body, is, and then you multiply that by 200 because there's 200 mitochondria in that single ovum, you realize that genetically, at the very moment of human life, we're hardly human. We're more mitochondrial. Then the bacteria come into play. As we exit the vaginal canal of mom, we start to get the entire flora, the big foundation of life, 
in the bacteria, 40,000 species, 1.4 quadrillion cells, so about 10 times less than the mitochondrion, which is interesting, but 2 million genes. 2 million genes that will make the enzymes that will do the work of your body. We now know that over 90% of the enzymatic work done in the human body is done by a bacteria. They are so genomically complex compared to the human that they have so many more pathways for detoxification. This whole fad of MTHFR defects in humans is being passed around, like people with chronic fatigue and all that. They say, oh, you have a genetic defect called the MTHFR, you can't detox well as if the human was ever responsible for detoxification. Pseudomonas has such cool enzymes that it actually digests radioactive material. How are we going to clean up Fukushima? We could have done that in the first couple of months if we had just moved in with enough pseudomonas. But instead, we used all kinds of fancy equipment and you know, all this mechanical machinery and separators, and all, none of it worked. To this day, did you know we're still dumping a million gallons of radioactive seawater back into the ocean at Fukushima? A million gallons a day still. Unbelievable. We are so short-sighted because we just think we're human. And we forget that 90% of life, not just in the human, but in the planet, is being done by a bacteria. And that doesn't even come close to taking a look at the rest of it. There are 300,000 species of parasites with 1.5 billion genes. We've been taught to fear parasites. We thought those were bad for us. What's the likelihood that 300,000 species of parasites are against us? They would have won. Five million species of fungi, 125 trillion genes. What is the intelligence at the genomic level of the fungi? 125 trillion genes. How many species of virus? We have no idea. Too complex to categorize. They change all the time. Way more than billions. I really believe we could categorize billions of different versions of viruses. Why am I so confident about that? Because we just came up with a very good estimate of how many viruses are on our Earth. And the number is quite large. It is 10 to the 31. That is a 1 with 31 zeros after it. We don't have a name for that number. It's not a billion, it's not a quadrillion, that's 10 to the 31. To put that in perspective, a, a galaxy, not a solar system, and obviously a galaxy like our Milky Way, has about one and a half billion suns in it. One and a half billion stars in our galaxy. And we're a small galaxy. And among the rest of the universe, we now think that there are one and a half billion galaxies. So take one and a half billion times one and a half billion, and you end up with a very large number that is 10 million times smaller than 10 to the 31. <laughs> That's how big the number 10 to the 31 is, and it's viruses on Earth. And we have a brilliant public health campaign backed by incredible science that we call the flu vaccine. <laughs> We're going to vaccinate you to one of the 10 to the 31 viruses, and thank God you would have died without that one. <laughs> What the hell are we thinking? This is not human health. This is not medical science. A vaccine program against a few of these quadrillions and quadrillions and 10 to 31 species around us, it has to be that the truth of this matter is that while we lack a philosophy of self-love, they don't. They have a philosophy of human love. They're taking care of you very well. And it's only your fight against them that harms you. It's only your effort to isolate yourself away from these species that you become vulnerable. And you do it in almost every way in which you've taught to live. You do it by getting in a plastic off-gassing car. You pull into a, a garage that's full of off-gassing chemicals from your herbicides, pesticides, and the gasoline in your vehicle itself that you breathe as soon as you get out of your car. And then you walk into a drywall box that you call a house that's full of weird, isolated species of fungi that can actually survive in the toxic environment of a human household. And then your doctor whips you on antibiotics every time you get a little bit of congestion or a urinary tract infection, annihilates your microbiome. You are so separated from this world, it's made us all vulnerable to the tune of 1 in 35 kids with autism, to the tune of 1 in 2 adults with cancer to the tune of 100% of us losing our cognitive function by age 28. So what is the gut? 
we've kind of called this the, the foundation, if you will, of this microbiome. This is where we most highly interact with this microbiome environment because it's the largest barrier we have to that outside world. Two tennis courts in surface area. Two tennis courts is a huge, huge surface area compared to your skin, which is only 1.5 square meters kind of laid out there. The gut barrier is massive, and it's only one cell layer thick, which seems like bad engineering. The, the lining of your gut is one layer of epithelial cells, which are, are about 100 microns in, in width. I'm sorry, 50 microns in width. 100 microns is the width of a human hair. So pluck a hair. Imagine cut it, slicing that longitudinally in half. You're now at 50 microns. You can hardly see this like invisible spider web-like thread. That's the thickness of your gut membrane. And it's responsible for keeping all of the food and chemicals you're about to consume in the right space and keep your microbiome in the right relationship to the rest of your body. That gut lining is tiny, it is precious, and it is our self-identity at the cell level. It is our self-identity. Without that barrier, our immune system right behind it becomes totally confused. What's outside? What's inside? I just have to start attacking everything. And so we get chronic inflammation and we get autoimmune disease, where we start attacking our own body with our own immune system and destroy our thyroid. Study done a long time ago, Division of Endocrinology at UVA, found that one in four girls in the United States in 2002 already had antibodies to her thyroid at age 12. One in four girls already destroying her own endocrine system with her own antibodies in this utter confusion of what is self. At the biologic level, we've lost our self-identity. Your gut contains over 200 million neurons, more than a dog's brain. Incredible. The gut produces the majority of the major neurotransmitters in the human body. We now know it produces over 90% of the serotonin, 50% of the dopamine. Gut intelligence is real. The gut feeling that you guys have heard about, I have this gut feeling that I shouldn't be doing this right now. Well, trust that. Don't trust the gray matter in your head. Butterflies, you get that, that anxiety in the gut. We have all of these experiences that we can point to of our gut intelligence. And so in this, we've started to think of the gut as the second brain. But just by the modus of how many neurotransmitters we make there alone, I think we really need to rethink that and start calling the gut the first brain and realize that this gray matter here is just a CPU chip. This is the central processing unit, just like a computer. But your computer has never written a poem. The CPU chip has never come up with an idea. It's the interaction with the outside world that creates anything. This is the CPU chip. What do you have to do for a computer to have anything on it? You have to put some data into it. Where does the data come from? Not from the brain. There's no way that any data comes from the brain. The data is processed by the brain, but never coming from the brain. Let me show you what this looks like biologically because it's freaking cool. This is coming out of UCSF, UCSD. I, I told you this, this tiny little cellophane layer of epithelial cells, half the width of a human hair, that protects your immune system and neurologic system from the outside world is this tiny little membrane. But it turns out it's not just barrier cells. It's these guys. This looks like something out of Ghostbusters, some green globule thing. That's a depiction of a cartoon of what we call a neuroendocrine cell or enteric endocrine cell that makes all of the serotonin, dopamine, and many other compounds that will go on to inform your neuro neurologic system. We used to think that all that serotonin couldn't get to the brain because it can't pass the blood-brain barrier until we found out this. This is an afferent nerve in the cartoon, a nerve that runs from your spinal cord up and touches and wraps itself into this green globule to receive the serotonin and neurotransmitters and everything else to pass it straight to the brain without need to go through the bloodstream and the blood-brain barrier. It gets even more eloquent. Here under microscopy now, this is digital imaging down at very high power. This is a green globule enteric endocrine cell and interlaced around it are the fingers and the intertwining of an afferent neuron. But it gets cooler, right? Like what the heck's going on over here? Well, that neuron that's commuting straight to your brain has, by, has stuck itself up between the adjacent cells and is sniffing the bacteria themselves. The microbiome we now know can talk directly to your brain, directly. In fact, the ion channels on the surface of this nerve are identical to the ion channels on the surface of the bacteria. They use the same mechanisms. 
look at how many of these enteric endocrine cells are intercalated into your gut. And so in pink, lighting up, I hope you can see it from where you're at, you can see all these pink cells laced within the blue cells, which are the epithelial lining. And so we have 10 to 15% of our gut lining covering two tennis courts and surface area. Literally billions and billions and billions of cells are producing the information that would be the data that would produce a thought in you. Whoa, that's really weird. And it gets stranger, else I'd disappoint you. This is the weirdest of the weird on this discussion here, is that we've now shown that indigenous bacteria from the gut microbiota regulate host serotonin biosynthesis. Meaning that the nerves that, or the enteric endocrine cells that will go to feed our nerves have to have these bacteria sitting on top of them or they can't make serotonin. In other words, if you don't have the right microbiome, you can't have a thought. And so this profound reality is very cool, but I want to point out one thing before I move to the next kind of conclusion thought, is that the vacuoles that form in these specific bacteria that have to be present on the enteric endocrine cells have exactly the same machinery and mechanism by which the neuron releases serotonin in the synapse of your brain. Biomimicry at its best. We mimicked bacteria in the way in which they communicate to create a human brain. That's pretty cool stuff. So as in, in the end, I now think of this as the third brain, this is the second brain, and this is the first brain. All thought, all experience, human consciousness itself has to arise from our experience, the data that's flowing into our bodies, which is coming through the microbiota. The bacteria, the fungi, the parasites, the viruses, they are the data that informs us who to become. How to work within Mother Nature comes from this data input. And if you isolate yourself with the lifestyle that I just described, you have no data. And so what do you wake up with? You wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. By this time, time in your life, you have enough wisdom to have experienced this many times where you're like, why the fuck am I here? <laughs> this is so depressing. What am I doing all of this stuff for? Why is my alarm going to go off in four hours and I'm going to go work for somebody? Or I'm going to go do something? Like, why? What are we doing here? Why am I here? We have a complete lack of data input. And so we've lost it. We've lost why we're here to be dialed into nature. Now you guys, as farmers and farm scientists and soil scientists, this is not news to you. You guys are doing what you're doing largely because it is your purpose. And if you start to lose sight, I know I'm in my purpose now in my life. I, there's no question. I don't wake up with any questions in my mind anymore. What I wake up with now is the insecurities of, I, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I can actually do it. I don't know if I have the energy to wake up and travel again tomorrow and talk to more beautiful human beings and... I get insecure. I get a sense of, I'm so close to collapse, but I'm looking at my kids, and god damn, we gotta, get a, we gotta get a world for them. They're so cool. My son's 20 years old, and I can tell he's exactly on track because he thinks I'm a complete idiot. <laughs> can hardly tolerate my, my intellectual presence. It's like this black hole. It's like, oh god, here's dad. You know, listen to some newfangled thought I have. It's just, it's nonverbal at that point. It's just, he's a brilliant young man, and it gives me hope that he showed up on purpose right now. Showed up on purpose, and it terrified me when I found out that his purpose, he felt like, was to go to Mars. I was like, really? Is that where we're at as a species? Is our most brilliant, most inspired, most on-purpose kids are just figuring out how we can leave this planet? I'm afraid of that. I think it's actually real. I think that's part of it. That's one of our options out of our situation. But my daughter showed up too. And that's when you get humble as a parent is when you have a second child. Because your first child comes along, you're like, I'm such a good parent. And then your second kid comes along, you're like, oh, I have nothing to do with this. this is a, I happen to be a bystander to this journey of these souls into this world because my daughter was the polar opposite of my son, always has been. 
She's now on Broadway, just got accepted to the American Musical Dance Academy. Very proud of her. She's training to be on Broadway as a, a performer and an entertainer. And that gives me hope, too. Because that's one of our other options, is what if we learn to laugh and love and, and speak Shakespeare to one another? What if we don't lose that heritage of real performance and entertainment and connection in theaters together? She's here on purpose, too. And so I look at these two kids, and either way, we win. Maybe we set up life on Mars and do it differently than we did here. Or maybe we learn to laugh and cry, as Shakespeare would have had us do. And we'll find that overarching philosophy of self-love, and we'll do it good in both places. Let's do it good in both places. Really cool situation is that this is communication back and forth now. We're finding out that we, after processing the information in the world, can talk back to our bacteria and change their, their behavior too. There is a bi-directional relationship, and so when we are in community, it's bi-directional, which only makes sense. There is no good relationship that's unilateral. And so we are in relationship with our microbiome. We're finding that our hormones and our thoughts, our reactions to our environment, will change our microbiome. Very powerful. If all of these things were, were separate, then we would be desperately in, in trouble. But the good news is all of those pathophysiologies from the brain to the cancer are the same. And it has to be because they all went vertical at the same time. And so I just showed you the exquisite relationship between the bacteria and the neurologic health and function of the human brain. Let's take a look at the cancer story. As a former chemotherapy designer, when these studies started to come out in the late, late 2000s, 2006, 2008, we started to hear some ripples out of the science community, UCSF, UCSD, started coming out with these articles saying, hey, we're decoding the microbiome genetics, and we're starting to see weird correlations between the genomics of the microbiome in your gut and the diseases you get. We were starting to realize that if you were missing these bacteria, you would get this type of cancer. If you were missing these bacteria, you would get this type of cancer. Not a single part of my understanding of the pathophysiology of cancer had bacteria in it. None of it. There was no place for me to fit that into the model. And I guarantee you, if you walk into any of the chemotherapy labs in the world right now, there is no place for microbiome in there. They still have the same dogmatic approach of this is a human cell problem, and all these things are breaking down the human cell. We need to treat it with drugs. And so we literally were laughing around my, I was in a lab that was studying brain cancer, brain tumors, and we would joke about these things like, you know, hope you have some good shit because otherwise you're really up the creek, you know? And so the, the, the laughter that we had, we really thought these were a bunch of hippies in California coming up with this half-baked story so that the activists could have some story as to how we needed to act. Fast forward to find out with humility, and in 2012 I found the molecule that, that would kind of close the story for me, but in humility, it is, again, the microbiome beginning the entire journey of not understanding the thought in our brain, but actually having the self-identity at the cellular level that would prevent the cancer from happening in the first place. So this incredible study was done in 2014. They, this is the first time they did qualitative survey of the breast microbiota, and that's pretty trippy. I just told you they were looking at the breast microbiome. Not many doctors or scientists have had the thought that maybe there's a healthy microbiome inside the human breast. But these researchers went and asked that bold question, and they found out that we are supposed to be an organic garden, not just in our gut, but through every organ in our body. They showed that in the breast cancer of these women, there was a bacteria called Methylobacterium radiotolerans that was very enriched. There was many other species there, but this was the dominant species in the breast cancer. They went on to biopsy the same women's healthy breast on the other side of the body and found out that Sphingomonas was the dominant bacteria in the healthy breast tissue. The idea that there was active microbiome in a healthy breast was mind-blowing and remains so. I give this lecture all the time to doctors, and they're just like, what? We were taught that if bacteria were in tissue, it would be cellulitis, and we would have a problem, and we should give antibiotics. Turns out that sphingomonas is an aerobic bacteria that works really well when your tissues are oxygenated and communicating and working well. As you start to accumulate stress and inflammation in a breast, it can't, sphingomonas can't tolerate the environment, and so we call in methylobacterium radiotolerans, which can tolerate an acidic anaerobic environment, and it's trying to be there. Well, 
this, at this point, they were starting to wonder if cancer is maybe actually an, an infective process where overwhelming methylobacterium happens and you get cancer. So maybe it's an infectious disease. So then they went on to answer that by doing a DNA load correlation with the advancement of the disease. Meaning about how many bacteria are in there and does the, the cancer get worse with the more bacteria that are there? That was the premise. They found the opposite. The less bacteria present, the faster the woman died of her cancer. Whoa. Methylobacterium wasn't a mistake. It showed up on purpose. Showed up on purpose with a, with a philosophy of love for human. Showed up on purpose to try to recover that woman's ecosystem in time to do it. And what do we do in response? We come along as doctors and bury that woman in chemotherapy, which necessitates the antibiotics, and we make that woman sterile, and she ends up dying years later from a very aggressive form of cancer. We make the terrain worse, and the cancer comes back more aggressive. That's what we do over and over again as doctors. We do short-term fix, to, which further decimates and destroys our connection to nature, and we end up with much worse disease a few years later. It happens over and over and over again. Incredible that the beginning of cancer, the beginning of collapse of self-identity at the human cell, is tied up in our microbiome. This is a really cool paper that just got shared. This is brand new. It hasn't even been published yet, so you guys are one of the first audiences to see this. University of Alabama in Birmingham uh, is the, the lab. Ro Rosalinda Robert Roberts is the first author on this poster that just got presented out in San Francisco. And this is a blood vessel in a human brain. This was cadaver study where they were studying uh, brains of healthy people, so people who had not died with any neurologic conditions, and they were studying this. And they kept finding this a cluster of bacteria hanging out in the brain tissue, having left the, the vasculature and were in the process of being present within the brain. We now have shown in another study that I don't have uh, represented here for you is that Candida glabrata, the famous yeast, shows up in its mycelial form in the brain of Alzheimer's patients when their brain function declines too far. The fungi come in and build a neural network in place of their dendritic trees, trying to help that person a little longer because they have a unifying philosophy of love the humans too. Antibiotic use, what's happened in the mitochondrial? 31% of C-sections in the US now by C-section, as high as 44% in Florida hospitals. China is reporting the 51% that I mentioned earlier. But look at our antibiotic prescription behavior. Once you're here and you arrive via C-section or otherwise, 833 prescriptions of antibiotics for every 1,000 man, woman, and child in America per year. 83%. 833 prescriptions for every 1,000 man, woman, and child. That's 8 million pounds of prescription of antibiotics per year to Americans. That's from a New England Journal of Medicine article 2013. Interesting, that number hasn't changed in over 15 years. We have been prescribing that same amount of antibiotic year in and year out. 30 million pounds of antibiotics, so five times more, is used in our meat, dairy, and poultry industry and ends up in our water systems and in our food itself. And so we have so much antibiotics steeping the biology. If I'm right that bacteria has somehow have a relationship to our death from cancer, then we should see a huge correlation between antibiotic use and cancer death. And that's what you see in this map. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine article showing which states, darker the state, the more antibiotics are prescribed. This is from the CDC showing where are you most likely to die from cancer. And can you see a state-by-state -state correlation here? Boom, boom, boom. Every single one of them lights up. Wow. When was the last time you got an antibiotic and your doctor said, you know what? Sorry you have UTI. Here's a course of Cipro. Sorry about the cancer death. What? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just increased your risk of dying from cancer in the next few years. What? Every course of antibiotics separates us from nature further, and this happens. Is it new? It is new. 1970, 1994, and frankly, every decade before that that we were keeping track, this was the death patterns of the different cancers. This is colon cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, all northeast, northeast, northwest. Prostate was always the, the outlier. All the other cancers were always northeast dominant. Suddenly, between 1994 and 2007, we reversed the map. We literally reversed the, the map. 
Keep in mind, cancer across the entire country went up drastically, doubled our rates across the country. But down here, it went crazy. This is a map from the Centers of Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, and you have never heard a single politician or a single doctor mention this. That is terrifying stuff. We did something nigh on to Chernobyl to cause some decimating event that changed our relationship to cancer. What could have that been? I certainly showed you that antibiotic prescriptions are happening in these countries, but I told you also that our antibiotic prescription behavior hadn't changed between 94 and 97 in 2007. Something else. What else hurt the microbiome in that 13 year period? And this is your number one antibiotic worldwide. Turns out, this chemical that you guys are familiar with, glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, is the most ubiquitous antibiotic on Earth now. I, why do I call it an antibiotic? Turns out it's not just me calling it an antibiotic. Monsanto never patented this as a weed killer. They, ant they patented it as an antibiotic, and then an antiparasite, and then an antifungal. This chemical kills microbiology. How does it kill weeds? It kills its microbiology. It also kills the plant through the same mechanism by which it kills the bacteria. So it's a, it's a two-fold sword. And so it kills weeds for sure, but it was never patented as a weed killer. In fact, when Monsanto bought the patent from a, from a Japanese researcher who invented the chemical in 1959, never put it on the market because he was like, that's a water-soluble toxin, that'd be stupid. <laughs> Monsanto came along, bought that patent, and they had no inkling of farming. They had no inkling of anything. They were trying to create the best pipe cleaner on the planet. So they bought it to clean industrial pipes of their, their residues of, of calcium and other deposits that were clogging the pipes. They literally bought it as a pipe cleaner. So they put it into large spread use as a pipe cleaner and found out that that worked so good to clean the crap out of the pipes it was, because it was a chelator. It was pulling all the mineral right back out of the pipe and then they found out that as the, the water and effuse from that pipe dumped into the pond behind the factory, it killed all the plants in the pond and killed all the life in the pond. And so they said, well, that's not going to work as a pipe cleaner. It's killing all that life. But it looks like it's killing plants. I wonder what that's about. So they ended up developing what was going to be a pipe cleaner into a weed killer, patented as an antibiotic. I mentioned that there's 30 million pounds of antibiotic being poured into our, our beef, pork, and lamb. But in this country right now, at our peak, we were using 500 million pounds of antibiotic of, in, through this course. And so many times more than we're using in, in, in kind of our pharmaceutical mindset of uh, uh, that we're using in the United States. Now worldwide, we're at 5.2 billion pounds of this antibiotic a year. And we double that roughly every six to seven years. 5.2 billion pounds of an antibiotic. Water-soluble antibiotic toxin. Bad idea on a planet that is 70% water. Why is that a bad idea? Because there's such a thing as the water cycle. When it goes into a field, Monsanto and all the chemical companies keep saying, don't worry, it's gone in like 24 hours. And they're right. You can't measure it in the soil right then. And 24 hours later, well, it's gone. Where'd it go? It went into the water of the plant. It went into the water that ran off the, the soil. It's now in the rivers. It's headed for the ocean. In the process of the big Mississippi hitting the ocean, what happens is evaporation. And so it's literally in the air you're breathing. 75% of the air samples throughout the whole Midwest contaminated with Roundup. 75% of the rainfall contaminated with Roundup because that evaporating water with the glyphosate ultimately became a cloud which would become the water that would rain down on your organic crops. The organic pita chips on the market often have way more Roundup than Fritos, which are made from corn of GMO often. There's so much so much chemical being dumped into our plants and into our ecosystem now that organic is only a stepping stone. We have to get much more creative and much more widespread than organic. We need to become bioregenerative. We need to help the microbiome chew up all the glyphosate in the world around us because it's raining on our organic crops right now. So this is the spraying pattern, 1992 to 2011. And if I'm right that this is the antibiotic that caused this shift, then we should see a huge correlation between this density here 
and this dash here, and it doesn't work so well. It looks like all the dash should be way up here. And certainly we see an increase kind of sneaking in here, but we should see huge death rates up in here. Why isn't that killing anyone? I didn't know why for about six months, and then I found this map by accident. You can't see maybe the white outline of the United States here. The red is the tributaries of the Mississippi River. Overlay that with that spraying map, and you realize you just picked up 85%, 90% of all the glyphosate sprayed in the country into one water system with a water-soluble toxin that has its last 90-mile course between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, Louisiana. And that is the highest rates of cancer in the entire developed world. We actually call it Cancer Alley. That 90 miles has been decimated over the last 13 years. A lot of those farmers and people living in that region are in their third and fifth cancers. We have a smoking gun of glyphosate into a single river system that created this pattern of disease. This is what it looks like from space. Bad news is we are doing so much damage now that you don't even have to enter the planet to see what we're doing. Just look from space. This is the agricultural space of that same tributary pattern. All the, all the light green is ag. At the end of the Mississippi River, coming out right here, is a dead zone that's larger than the state of New Jersey. We have wiped out biology here. The redder the color, the less oxygen is present in the water. You can see that the stress state is nearly the size of two states. Way larger than the state of Florida is this giant threatened zone now at the end of this filter. That, that, that is the close up there of Louisiana. Mississippi comes out right here. Do you think there's a correlation between the ocean dead zone and our Mississippi River and our farming introduction of a huge antibiotic? What does the antibiotic do as soon as it hits the water? Kills the microbiome. What does a dead microbiome look like? That's the dead zone. This is living ocean. You can, this is a big problem. This is an algae bloom that has showed up. Why? Because the algae bloom's a problem? No. It's the only species left that can deal with the toxicity that we have in that water right now, and it showed up to help digest it. We need to stop trying to kill the algae, which is now what we're trying to do, is to kill the red tide so that the tourist season doesn't get disrupted. Holy shit, we are so stupid. We keep doing the same thing over and over again, over and over again. We keep killing the microbiome because we think it's the problem, because we don't have an overarching philosophy. This is what it's looking like in the rivers. This is an algae bloom in the river. It's literally tides of just the few species left that can survive in the muck that we've created. Keep in mind that it's half a hair's width of distance between us and the food we consume. These finger-like projections look a lot like a coral reef and function much like a coral reef. Behind it, all of this purple tissue is what we call the GALT, the gastrointestinal associated lymphatic tissue. This is some 60 to 70 percent of the volume of your entire immune system in your body sitting just millimeters within the lining of your gut. That's where we create more than 80 percent of the antibodies to foreign material that would go to cause things like autoimmune disease and the rest. As we lose that and we get that chronic inflammation, chronic overwhelm, we get that chronic inflammatory event that drives everything. So, glyphosate, horrible antibiotic, but what if it did something else? This is our laboratory's work now. This is uh, John Gilday's work under our immunohistochemistry microscope. Immunofluorescence is a very cool process. Can I have a time check real quick? I want to make sure. 1208. This is uh, looking down at the small intestine. The green is highlighting Velcro that's holding all of these cells of the epithelial boundary together. Glyphosate at 20 parts per million, which is what you might see in a conventionally grown beet or other root crop, will blow that apart in 16 minutes. That's suddenly a leaky sieve. And terrifyingly, these, these cells already look like cancer cells. They've gone from this plump, nice, big epithelial cell into this fibroblast short shape that's lost all of its cytoplasmic volume, which means it's a precancerous cell. This whole BS about the WHO saying this is a, pr a probable carcinogen, and then they got so much flack from industry that they had to rephrase that and say it's a possible carcinogen. It is a carcinogen. 
It causes it in 16 minutes. Monsanto, ironically, published their own cancer results in the late 80s, saying that this stuff causes cancer. And they showed it in multiple species. The reason why they published that is they could not envision at the time, I believe, the possibility that there would be that much Roundup in the ecosystem to cause cancer. And they like, so they said basically, you know, yeah, it causes cancer, but look how much we would have to have in the environment. And then in 1996, they figured out a genetically modified corn, soybean, and the rest to be directly sprayed, and suddenly it was no longer a weed killer, it was a crop treatment. And suddenly we fast forward another 20, 10 years, and we suddenly had plenty of Roundup in the ecosystem. That company in the late 80s had no idea that they would be selling 5.2 billion pounds of a chemical a year. Who thinks that's going to happen? That would be stupid. <laughs> they didn't even predict their own problem. And so glyphosate blows apart our self-identity. Interesting. Keep in mind that it's not just those, it's the globlet cells of your brain. Who's heard of gluten sensitivity? The active ingredient in gluten is gliadin. So that, that's one of the, the 13 breakdown products within gluten that will go on to cause a leaky gut. And this is what it looks like again. So we just saw the leaky gut from glyphosate. Here's intact epithelial lining. You can see the zipper together, tight junctions. The blue is the nucleus of the cells. Seconds later, we see that collapse happen. There's huge gaps between the tight junctions now. This is a leaky sieve. And you can see a flush of green now inside the cell as those proteins are reabsorbed, damaged, and need to be reprocessed for future use. And so we blow that apart with gliadin. Well, how did that happen? Gliadin's been in the diet for thousands of years. Why, since 1992, do we suddenly have an epidemic of gluten sensitivity? And it comes down to this paper that we published a couple years ago, is that we showed that if you happen to put glyphosate in the same bite of food as the gluten, you get an 80% drop in the membrane. Not this little gentle push that's barely beyond, so this is the error bars here. And so this, you could argue, is hardly a, a statistically significant drop. Functionally, you're losing about 15% of the membrane, but statistically speaking, not there. You suddenly put those two in the same bite of food, and you get the horrendous destruction of the gut membrane. We now worked out how that happens. Glyphosate exposure upregulates the CXCR3 receptor in the gut lining, which is the exact receptor that binds to the gliadin that would then trigger zonulin, which then opens up the zonulin toxin pathway that degrades the tight junctions. We cause leaky gut by a, a sensitization of glyphosate. Why is all the glyphosate in the gluten? Because we started spraying the wheat in 1992. And so we literally added in 1992 for the first time in the human experience a chemical to the gluten that would make us gluten sensitive. And every gluten sensitive patient who goes to Europe has the joyful experience of eating a croissant in Paris and being like, I have no problem. I can eat croissants all day long. And so when they come back and they tell me this, I'm always like, why did you come back here then? <laughs> Paris is pretty good. Croissants are awesome. Like, why'd you get back on the plane? You could have stayed. They come back and they eat one piece of bread and it takes them three days to get over the brain fog because we've got too much glyphosate in our gluten. That's what it looks like. The CXCR3 receptor pops up on the surface of the epithelial cells, binds to gliadin, gliadin produces zonulin, zonulin widens that type, that type junction. All kinds of non-selective food nutrients are now getting into your immune system. The immune system makes immune reactivity, IgA antibodies, IgG antibodies, IgM antibodies that would cause anaphylaxis, and then you pump those right back out into the lumen of the gut, which is going to start to interact, of course, with the microbiome, and you get devastation of the microbiome, you end up with small bowel overgrowth, all kinds of weird things. Here's the correlation with black line with the number of acres sprayed with glyphosate on wheat and the occurrence of celiac disease, the autoimmune disease to gluten, year on year, between 1990 and 2010. Here's the line of acres of glyphosate applied to corn and soybean and the rates of autism. I mentioned all of this cool stuff with your brain, speaking directly to the microbiome and everything else. And so when I show this slide and everything is blowing apart, remember that's not just your immune system, that's your neurologic system losing its entire manufacturing plant for serotonin and dopamine. You can't have thought when that system falls apart. And so an autistic child is ultimately a picture of a child who can make no sense of all the data flowing into its body overwhelming its immune system, overwhelming its neurologic system, and it can't make sense of the data. 
this is the most terrifying. You guys are the second audience to see this, the first audience to see this in person. Get goosebumps. When you're the first human being to see something, that is an honor. Because ultimately what we know is what we experience, and we can't know what we haven't experienced. You guys are about to experience information that no other humans have experienced. Whenever we see something like this in the lab, we just, it's overwhelming. It's such an honor to be in a position to experience something that we would add now. All of you are gonna add this to the collective human experience, and it needs to change our behavior immediately. Because everything I told you so far was the warm up. This is the bad news. Actin protein is the scaffolding of the entire human matrix. Forget the gut membrane, forget the blood brain barrier. Every cell depends on actin. This is the scaffold protein of our body. You can see it defined here in these bright red lines between that are in the, the focus of the microscope. They're present throughout this whole specimen, but you can't see it because uh, of the, the folds that are happening in the tissue. If we refocus the microscope, you'll see them, you see them all over the place. After just a couple hours, we see complete destruction of the entire actin system. And now instead of bright lines, we literally see black holes. There's black lines of complete paucity of protein around every single cell. Every single cell is losing its structure when it's exposed to glyphosate. Every single cell in your body starts to go into chaos with glyphosate. This screws up the synthesis of fuel out of the mitochondria because the mitochondria living within your cells rely on actin for their incredibly exquisite architecture that allows them to take glucose and fat and turn it into the only fuel we use, which is ATP, which doesn't come out of our food at all. So if you screw up mitochondria by killing its actin, you can't produce the energy that would go on to heal you or make you run. So the fatigue that you feel setting in, the achiness, the lack of energy, the brain fog, everything that you and I have to wake up and push against and we stimulate ourselves, we created Starbucks, right? Starbucks didn't create us. We're stimulating the hell out of ourselves trying to push through the milieu because we are literally every cell now in chaos control and damage control state because we're eating, drinking, breathing, and being rained on by a chemical that's destroying the very fabric of life. The cells that are most affected by this actin collapse are kidney tubules. This is the spraying pattern for uh, the glyphosate in red. In, in blue is the number of acres of uh, genetically engineered corn and soybean planted every year between 1996 2010, and the bars are death worldwide from chronic kidney disease. We are literally taking the architecture of life out from underneath us. It gets worse. <laughs> Glyphosate prevents the production of our protein building blocks called amino acids. The patents from Monsanto and other chemical companies proved that the shikimate pathway was the target for these chemicals, and so they said that it's totally safe for humans. There is no way this chemical can hurt humans because they don't even have the enzyme pathway that we're blocking with this drug. Not even, they don't even have it. Well, that sounded good, except all the regulators must have forgotten to ask, well, what do those enzymes make that we don't have? They make what we call the essential amino acids. They are the phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, histidine, thyroxine, L-dopa, and 5-HTP, amino acids that we can't make. And they happen to be the building blocks for the vast majority of proteins in the human body. And so we killed the microbiome in the soil and the plants that we grow in that soil and their ability to make the essential amino acids that we had to get from our nutrition. What would happen if our mothers suddenly were birthing or developing in their womb an embryo that didn't have the right amino acids? The amino acids are just like the English alphabet. You've got 26 letters that can make over 200,000 different proteins. But the vowels are the essential amino acids. The nine essential amino acids, if you would delete the vowels, you're now going to literally misspell every single protein there. You just subtracted the vowels out of the alphabet, and now you're going to misspell. And so what is that, that fetus going to look like when it becomes an infant? 
It's going to have dysfunctional protein pathways. It's going to have dysfunctional enzymes because those are ultimately proteins that have to fold into complex three-dimensional and four-dimensional structures. I said four-dimensional, thank you, Gerald Pollack, for uh, the fourth phase, the fourth dimension, and everything else. Four dimensions of protein folding have to happen correctly. And if you misspell it, it misfolds and therefore loses some of its efficacy and becomes more vulnerable to destruction. Can't we just use spell check? There is actually spell check in the DNA. You're, that's a good question, actually. Why aren't we just spell checking? What's happening is that the spell checker is saying, oh, shoot, we don't have any phenylalanine. So we're going to have to grab a guanine and we're going to do that. So the spell checker is trying to do the right thing. But there's literally no option. There is no phenylalanine, so it just keeps putting in the guanine. And so it has to keep putting a U in place of the O because it's missing the U. And so the spell checkers are pretty impressive, by the way. How much DNA? I mentioned 20,000 genes as if that's wimpy. Can you stand up for a moment, Dorothy? Time check. Nobody wants to tell me the time because we want to keep going. Oh, uh, 12, 20. So a meter, you know, just one arm is enough, but you can put two, both out because it, it looks cool. <laughs> and you can put that one down. So a meter uh, of DNA, about the length of her arm to her neck there, uh, that's how much DNA she has in every single one of her cells. She has 70 trillion cells in her body. If we took that one meter and we lined up all the DNA in her 70 trillion cells, how far do you think Dorothy would go? How many times could we, say, wrap her around Mother Earth? Mother Earth is 28,000 miles or something in circumference. How many times? 200 million. Amazing. This woman <laughs> would wrap around Earth 2 million times. This woman wraps around Mother Earth 2 million times. So if we could really see her, if you could really see Dorothy, you would not be sitting there looking at us dumbly. You would be on your knees, so grateful that a miracle like this woman would show up and that she would be able to be who she is and that she would be able to be in purpose and intention and love her children and grandchildren and this grandchild of her that was just born, she hasn't met. She's going to meet a grandchild this week with another 70 trillion cells with enough DNA to wrap around Mother Earth two million times. And whatever that kid's situation is, we know they showed up on purpose. And so we can all get down on our hands and knees before these infants and be so grateful to be in the presence of the miracle of other human beings. <sighs> and the type 1 diabetic father. Thank you. We should be in awe. We should be so terrified to screw with Mother Nature. We should be in utter respect for what she would do for us. Because in the foods that we make, we should have the medicine to treat everything that we possibly could develop as a disease. Wasn't that Hippocrates 2,000 years ago? Let thy food be thy medicine. He actually learned it from the Chinese doctors, I believe, because they said it 4,000 years ago. Let thy food be thy medicine. Totally true, right up until 1996. And suddenly, we sprayed our food with glyphosate that blocks the ability of our plants to make alkaloids. And the alkaloids are the families of the medicine in your food. We literally now grow food that is devoid of its medicine. And the medicine is pretty powerful. There are anti-malarials. Malaria, malaria is now the number one cause of death on the planet from infectious disease. Antispasmodics. These are the ones that would keep neuromuscular stress out of the body. The number one complaint historically in primary care clinics is low back pain spasms. Anti-cancer, one in two males. Colonomimetics. These are the neurotransmitter modulators that would keep an autistic brain under control. Missing. Vasodilatory compounds that would keep hypertension and renal function normal number one cause of death worldwide, chronic kidney disease. Antiarrhythmics, the ones that would stop us from dying of our minor heart attacks, gone from our food. Analgesics, gone from our food, and we now have the largest opiate addiction in history. Did you know that Bayer, who just bought Monsanto, first made their major breakthrough as a pharmaceutical company in the early 1900s with the patenting and marketing of a really exciting new opiate that was the that was called the non-addictive morphine. You know what that drug was called? 
heroin. They patented heroin and put it on the market as the non-addictive morphine. That didn't work out so well. Now our children and, our, and their grandparents in West Virginia are both dying of narcotic overdose, fentanyl, and the rest. Antihyperglycemics in the food, no more. Why do we, does everybody have prediabetes and diabetes? Doc Hall. Comparable data on dicamber or P4D or another drug? Great question. Doc Hall asks, you're talking about Roundup and glyphosate. Is there other compensatory kind of data around things like 2,4-D and atrazine and all these other chemicals? Well, guess what? We made Monsanto so rich so fast because they came along with this chemical that says it's going to be way less toxic than atrazine and 2,4-D. And they were right way less cancer-causing effects in glyphosate than atrazine and 2,4-D. And so it became the norm. It was way less toxic than DTT, uh, DDT. So it looked like it was the right direction. We didn't know it was going to have all these off-target effects. It became the worst chemical on the planet because it was no longer a direct toxin. It was an indirect threat to the fabric of nature. And we poured it in strong. So they are definitely toxic chemicals. Interestingly, now that Roundup is failing in the United States, you guys are all familiar with all the Roundup-resistant weeds. Now that it's failing, guess which chemicals we're spraying? 2,4-D and atrazine again. Atrazine is currently number one again in the United States. We've gone back 40 years to cancer-causing compounds that are akin to Agent Orange, and we're spraying our food with Agent Orange now. Stunning, ridiculous repeats of behavior. All right, I already told you those numbers. I got to keep moving here. Are probiotics the answer? No. It turns out this article just coming out just a few months ago in September says the probiotics are actually doing as much harm as the antibiotics in many ways. Now, I've been preaching against probiotics for five years now and finally have the data to put behind my lectures. This is showing two weeks of an antibiotic exposure and its decimating effect on observed species within the microbiome of the stool of mice. And so you've got this drop in biodiversity from 90 species down to maybe 20. Give back fecal transplant with their own fecal material that you collected before the antibiotic and they recover within 30 days. Beautiful job, nice. Everybody should be eating their own poop, it looks like. <laughs> There's actually some rationale to that. That might be the answer. If you have to have an antibiotic, what should you do? You should probably you know, pack up your poop, freeze it, and start eating that in a couple months. Decimation of the probiotic or uh, antibiotic, and then they were given just spontaneous recovery, the red line. So they started to recover pretty quickly. By 40 days, they'd already recovered more than half of their, their, their loss, and so they were starting to look pretty good. But if they were put on a probiotic, they had a momentary improvement, lasted maybe 15 days, and then suddenly declined again, so that by 30 days after the antibiotic, they were as bad as they were with an antibiotic, and it persisted. No recovery of the microbiome on a probiotic. The only time four months ago that I was willing to put a pa patient on probiotics was right after an antibiotic. I thought that was logical. No, I was doing more harm. That was the worst possible time to take an antibiotic is right after, or a probiotic is right after an antibiotic. I don't have time to go into all this other cool data. This was the human side. They said, well, if that's true, what the hell are we doing to humans? And they showed the same thing. This time they followed them for six months instead of 50 days. And the green line, again, is the probiotic. At six months, they still hadn't returned to their normal biodiversity. But there's one other piece of data that's des dismal in here. There were 90 species at baseline in the mouse, and there's 70 in the human at baseline. We don't even have the biodiversity of a rab lat. What the hell is going on with the human microbiome? We are so separated, so isolated. Yeah. That's exactly what your appendix is. So we've been removing appendices and telling people that's a worthless thing because you're not a rabbit. You don't eat wood anymore. So why would you need an appendix? It turns out that just in the last few years, it was found that it is the record bank of the microbiome. Every single species of the microbiome picks up a special one millimeter area of the, of the appendix. It's a long tube that gets more and more anaerobic as it goes down the tube. It's a blind dead end. 
because you need all of those different ecosystems to support all the different things. So if you get wiped out by a virus, you better have a data bank of the entire microbiome to re-inhabit the gut. That's what's happening if you don't put yourself on a probiotic. Look how fast the human recovered. At 30 days, 100% recovery of the microbiome if you took no probiotic. Where did that come from? It came from the appendix and other places, tonsils, etc. But we've been broad scale surgeries on tonsils and, and appendices for, for decades. We are killing our microbiome and ha ha uh, habitation. Now, this was the miracle of 2012, so I have to leave you some good news that there's a way out of this because Mother Nature does have an overriding philosophy and it is about human love. So we've known forever that bacteria produce the macronutrients and the micronutrients, fat, sugar, proteins, micronutrients, manganese, calcium, all that cool stuff. And then in 2012, I'm standing in my nutrition center and I'm seeing patients get sick or not better on health food, literally inflammation going up on kale. So I was trying to figure out what the hell was wrong with the kale, what's wrong, and that ended me up in soil science. I had no idea what, I just thought it was dirt. I was like, why? My, my uh, partner brings in a 90 page white paper on soil science. A typical white paper is like five to eight pages. 90 pages, somebody took their whole lifetime to study dirt and write this paper. I was like, that is dumbfounding. Tearing through this thing, because I'm late to a patient, flip to page 40, and sitting there is this molecule, and this is why I'm here. I showed up for that. One second. For some reason, my brain looked at that molecule and didn't see two dimensions. That's a three-dimensional structure that popped out at me that looks a hell of a lot like the chemotherapy I used to make. That was an aha moment that changed the rest of the course of my life. The realization that what if the plants aren't our medicine? What if the soil was the real source of all the medicine? And the plants are just a course of action to get it to our mouths. That was the aha moment, and so immediately I had to figure out where these guys came from in soil, and when I found out they were made by bacteria, that was the close the loop, of course. If you're missing the wrong bacteria, you're gonna get cancer because they can make something akin to chemotherapy. They could make something to kill that cancer if that bacteria was present, and it closed my loop of nutrition, microbiome, and my cancer research suddenly all came into the same split second and that's what we've been working on. We find out now that there's 15 to 20 different variants of this molecule made by every species of bacteria, fungi, et cetera, to create uh, millions and millions and millions of different variants of that molecule to function as millions and millions and millions of different types of medicine for you. But interestingly, it's not actually functioning as a medicine directly. It actually functions instead as a communication network. We started with a four minute workout, nitric oxide dump. I told you that molecule is a redox molecule. It's one part of a very complex communication network. This is very much like the wireless communication network of your body. Your cell phone works all the time. The computer in there has a transmitter and a receiver that never breaks, unless you have an iPhone, then they seem to break all the time. But if you have an Android, it's a really you know, solid piece of structure and you walk around with that thing and you're solid, and then suddenly it stops working. And you're like, I didn't drop it. Well, you're seven miles from the closest cell phone tower. It's the same thing in the cellular level as your cell phone. Once you distance yourself too far from the source of the, the wireless communication, your minor transmission from your single cell can't be heard five, 10 cells or 10,000 or 10 million cells later. You're losing the wireless communication network as the microbiome collapses and you lo lose that whole communication system. First thing I had to do was prove that I could make this stuff safe because as I started studying soil extracts, they're all extremely oxidative. They do damage to every tissue it touches. So I had to figure out how to do this and it turns out my chemotherapy research had prepared me perfectly to know how to get oxidative compounds into a redox state. So I applied my chemotherapy knowledge to start to try to work with the dirt and very quickly with the help of a couple of extraordinary colleagues, we came up with the recipe to get those not only safe but for the first time since 1969, we were able to extend the life of human cells and culture. We actually made them live 15 to 20% longer. We decreased apoptosis or programmed cell death in colon, small intestine, and kidney very rapidly. The kidney is the most sensitive cell in the entire body, so we use it for all of our drug toxicity studies and look at the shift that we saw in kidney tubule cells. They loved the communication network or the microbiome. Extended the life of those guys for the first time since 1969 because up until now, we had always studied human biology in the sterile petri dish. 
we actually don't know human biology at all. Every single study paid for by your National Institutes of Health done in a sterile petri dish without nature involved, we literally don't know human biology. And that's why we keep failing to believe in healing. The body heals instantaneously if it has some communication from nature. And that's what we get to see right here. Glyphosate blows apart the membrane. You take the communication network back in that doesn't do anything in of itself. It doesn't have the stuff that would build proteins. It doesn't have any of the machinery that could do this. Instead, the human cell goes and repairs itself almost instantly. We've now followed this out to six days of treatment on these membranes, and we see a higher degree of protection from the outside world than's ever been measured in laboratories, period. Microbiome is the source of your cell identity, just like it's the source of your ideas and your creativity. It is the data field for everything. This is what happens to gluten sensitivity. Add gliadin, falls apart. You add back the communication network, it zippers right back together. If you take the, the, the communication network first, you see a big doubling of the amount of protection to begin with, and then you threaten it, and there's no collapse whatsoever. Same thing with the glyphosate, actually. We've shown that if we give the, give the control membrane, give it back to the communication network first, then we add glyphosate, and you do no damage. John Gilday, my PhD, I was talking to him, which means I was distracting him, so he screwed up an experiment. It takes us weeks to grow a cohesive small intestine membrane like this, and he suddenly dumped in the glyphosate to do the experiment and realized he had forgotten to dilute it, and we ended up with 20,000 times more glyphosate in there than we meant to have in there, 20,000 times more glyphosate than you'd ever see in your diet, and the next morning everything looked perfect. Antidote to the chemical insanity of humans is the bi microbiome's intelligence. Amazing, amazing journey. Here's what it looks like under a functional study control measuring the amount of electrical electricity held across the membrane. Looks pretty good. It's acting as an insulator. Give it glyphosate, suddenly leaks. You lost the copper or you lost the plastic off the copper wire, and now the electrons are leaking right across. That's how tight these tight junctions are, which is pretty amazing. They can keep out electrons, okay? And so a functional gut membrane is so cohesive and so intelligent that it can literally work as a, a, a insulator against electricity. Amazing, beautiful biology. The terahydrate, which is the communication network in the microbiome, you put that on and looks what happens. Not only did it protect you from the glyphosate, you got stronger than you ever were before. We don't know what human physiology looks like in connection with nature. We're stronger than you would ever think. We're more resilient than you would ever no, and your pharmaceutical companies certainly don't want you to know that. Actin protein, blown apart every single cell in your body, give it back to the communication network, and we see 20% more actin than it was there to begin with. Mother Nature is our angel. We are extracting these compounds from fossils that are 60 million years old on purpose, because 55 million years ago we had the extinction of the dinosaurs because we lost the topsoil. So to find the most intelligent topsoil on Earth, you got to go back 60 million years ago. So we're taking a fossil soil, 60 million years old, extracting the carbon molecules, bring it all to Virginia. We would put it through the redox uh, chemistry pathway, and we, we reinvigorate those molecules. 60 million years ago, the antidote to the chemical that we would spray into her soils today to kill the nature, she placed the antidote. What kind of grace is that? What kind of overriding philosophy of human love is that? So we need to learn from nature. We need to learn self-love. Of course, if we screw up, we need the antioxidant cascade. This is glutathione, the most ubiquitous, ubiquitous antioxidant in the body. It accounts for 85% of all the antioxidants in your body, and you can't take it in exogenously. It just doesn't work well. You're supposed to make it in your own cells. This is that baseline, the small intestine, making a little bit of, glu of uh, glutathione. After 18 hours of exposure, which is important that it was such a durable response, because when you take oral glutathione, it only lasts for four or five minutes. But 18 minutes, I mean, 18 hours later, you're making 800 times more antioxidants to deal with the adversity within your body. Not because there's any glutathione in the, the stuff we're giving, there's zero. It's that the human body realizes it, it could get healthier. It's in touch with nature. It should be bulletproof. It should heal all the time. And so 800% improvement. 
So these are all the things. This is just a summary slide of what's happened, uh, all the things we've proved out. I don't have time to repeat everything. Uh, it's become a dietary supplement line. There's a pet line that we've produced now. And the most exciting thing is Luma Shield. It's now coming out in Canada in about two or three months. Uh, I'll be back up in Ottawa in a few weeks, uh, giving our last data from our large-scale cattle trials. But we have been proved as a drug uh, to go into the human food chain. You, can't, you have to be regulated as a drug, not a supplement. And so we've gone through the, the laborious effort to actually become a drug and become regulated as a drug by the CFIA, the FDA of, the, of Canada. And they approved us to be the very first compound in their low-risk drug category to be approved in Canada. And it's going to be going into cattle's large scale, and our trials are mind-blowingly cool. One of the very cool things that we're showing is that as soon as you add the communication network and the microbiome into these suffering cows, they have to eat less. They actually gain more weight on less food. We're seeing a food efficiency improvement of 6 to 10 percent. If you extrapolate that across the 100 million cattle in North America right now, we will save more farmland, more produce than, could be, than, than would cover the entire state of Florida. One product going into their feed, we will reduce the demand on the industry for genetically modified crops that are currently feeding our cattle will be reduced with this one little gift from the microbiome. The other really cool thing that that does is it immediately reduces the amount of methane made out of the backside of that cow, which is the number one greenhouse gas on Earth right now. Six times more potent than CO2 in raising the Earth's temperature is the methane from our cows. And we reduce it by giving back the intelligence of the microbiome. Between this and regenerative agriculture, we expect to reverse global warming over the next decade with your help. This is my call to action for all of you guys. I've really appreciated your attention so far. But this is the call to action. This is a new nonprofit that's just coming online. The website's right there, farmersfootprint.us. We are losing 11% of our gross domestic product to soil loss every year now. It is the most expensive commodity loss ever in history, and nobody is talking about it at the government level. So this is, um, I want to show a trailer real quick of the documentary series that we're building so that you can do it. This is just a couple minutes long. I'm sorry I'm over time. If anybody needs to leave, please do. I won't take any offense. And also, uh, thank you for your time for that. I can never find her. She goes. Single water system. And if this is the most prevalent antibiotic in our environment, 
was decimating the microbiome in the soils, we had a smoking gun. Maybe this is the event that, that really transformed public health. 20 years ago, we couldn't have put together 10 people to talk about this. But today, the number of people that are interested in regenerative practices and adaptive practices is growing very rapidly. And what a joy to find out that farmers are ahead of the doctors here in knowing that the solutions are at hand. You come to understand that life is far more than just us and that we're part of the far bigger world. And this far bigger world also is part of us and is what gives us our nourishment, our well-being, our satisfaction in life. So that's the mission now, is uh, to rejoin, not just to tell you guys that you're doing the right thing, because you are doing the right thing, and this room is full, and more full than it's ever been, and will continue to grow. So I congratulate the organizers of this event for creating more and more momentum towards this story. But the power that we're bringing with this documentary series to educate consumers is to actually have their call to action be $100 a year to support one acre of chemical farmland to be regenerative within three years. Our goal is for that to change the world. And so I was just up in Saskatoon. There was over one and a half million acres of, of, of ag chemical agriculture in that one room as we spoke through all of this truth together and see this commitment from 420 farmers ready to make this transition. And one and a half million acres is enough to really get that foothold to re reverse global warming in Canada. And so we're eager to see 10 million acres over the next five years converted in North America, and then we'll go global, showing the impact as we repair and allow nature to come back into that dead zone at the end of the Mississippi. And we see the ocean improving. We see the economy approving for these farmers, going from $40 net profit per acre to $500 per acre net profit. There is an economic incentive that is so present, they just need to get over the hump. And $100 an acre is not much to do as a family per year to be part of this massive solution. So farmersfootprint.us become part of the solution so that my biotech companies go out of business within the next couple decades. Let's get this done. Thank you all for your time. Have a wonderful day.